something down in the shop. It's up. You go in the middle. You go in the middle. No, because that's too far. You can move in a bit more. Yeah. Perfect. This way. Okay. Take another one. Look this way. We live already. It's live. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Laura Bonas Palmer. I'm the director here at the Palmer Gallery. Um, we are getting ready to start our artist talk on uh, Victor Davidson's exhibition in full bloom. Um, the talk is going to be moderated today by Mr. Roger Tucker, uh, the founder of Tucker Contemporary Arts. And we're getting ready to start. So, Victor and Roger. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Laura. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here with a very good friend for over 30 years um, in my hometown of Newark, New Jersey. Um, to be sitting here with uh, our thought leader and cultural leader for so many years see this glorious work that he's produced. Um, for those of you who don't know Victor, and um, most of you do here in the audience, uh, Victor is a, um, an artist, a, um, an incredible the director of Algyra Gallery in Newark, New Jersey for over 30 years which really put Newark and art and underrepresented artists on the cultural map. Uh, people thought about art 30 years ago as being a place, or, or, or you know, art as a place that was mostly regional, local, national. But Victor made art in Newark through Algyra global. And many of the global artists that we celebrate today had their first start at Algyra. So um, thank you, Victor. Um, so we're going to be talking about In Full Bloom, this extraordinary uh, body of work that Victor created. And um, Victor, my first question to you is, please share the genesis of this body of work here in the Well, the genesis of this body of work, first of all, this is only a fraction of the work that got created over the past 18 months. There there are paintings that could not fit into this space because some of them are 25 feet long. And so, um, but this is Laura's, these, these specific images are Laura's selection. And so before I say anything else, I want to thank Laura for putting this show together and for the way she cared about the work and respects the work. I think she visited me at home at my studio twice, and um, so this is a this is a a, a, uh, 
a work of, of a work of love and respect, you know, for you know what I was preoccupied with for the 18 months or or two years once I left New York in March 2020. I was deeply steeped in this. I also got tremendous support from my wife, Sibley Cunningham, who had to do with the Genesis very specifically, very specifically. Um, with us today is also Cynthia Hawkins, Dr. Cynthia Hawkins, who has been a supporter of my work for decades. And Cynthia offered shows, solo shows, because she directed the uh, uh, letter of gallery uh, uh, at, at uh, Geneseo, uh, uh, SUNY. Uh, she offered individual shows, solo shows, to Cicely and to me. But Cicely and I decided we would do a collaboration. Out of the collaboration, came these watercolors that are here, and, um, and out of uh, that, we developed this, this, this book. Um, you should get it, pick it up, it's for 10 or 12 dollars on Amazon, it's still a book of ours. It contains the project, the collaboration that we did, this is an idea, and, um, and uh, there's an interview, a long interview, that Cynthia, our friend here, did, uh, uh, that is a text that illustrates, yeah, yeah. You can speak louder. So, um, so Book of Ours, and the Book of Ours is actually based on another book, Thomas Martin Book of Ours. And this is a, this is a, this is a, Thomas Martin was a poet and a writer very religious, a monk, very creative. And so we kind of stole that title and then added ours in the end, Book of Ours, Ours. Um, what I should also mention is that Cicely and I have a ritual, and the ritual is that um, uh, we generally, on Sundays, we, we have church, church. <laughs> And the church usually involves um, uh, sometimes readings that are steeped in Buddhism, and, uh, and then it involves reading other texts. I mean, one of the texts that we completed um, um, recently is something is a text called uh, "The Oldest Story." Uh, it's, it's a book by Richard Powers. And it's about 500 pages long, but it's about trees. It's about trees, and it's about uh, the forest, and it's about people who will give their life to save trees. Um, and it, it's an incredibly instructive, instructive, I would say, document on. Understanding our ecosystem and understanding the importance of trees, not just as inanimate objects, or but trees as sentient beings, and also our relationship to trees as human beings. Um, I mean, one fu fundamental thing about trees is that we take for granted every day is that trees give off oxygen which we need to live, we need to function. And we give off carbon monoxide, which is a kind of exchange, trees can use that. But it, the relationship of trees to each other is also a very complex thing. And, and out, of, out of reading this book, reading Richard Powell's book and texts actually, um, something very deeply spiritual happened. 
to me in terms of my own awakening, my own consciousness, becoming aware of trees as things that are part of an ecosystem that I'm only part of. An awareness that trees are not just about, you know, lumber or extraction, which is the larger issue. So, coming home from Newark, and because I'm home, because I'm not running to Newark to run Express Newark, and I'm caught up with nonprofit stuff and the politics of, you know, all of that, what it means, and fundraising, suddenly I'm, I'm aware of what's going on around me. And I'm, I'm suddenly waking up to the fact that where I live, I'm surrounded by trees. They're beautiful. They're changing. And we also live in a, in a, in a cottage, small cottage. You know, I live in a small cottage, um, which is sort of, you know, I, I think it's from, built in the 1930s or so. Um, and it's this craftsman style. So it's built in a way that allows you to experience being inside, but also seeing the outside, wherever you were, wherever you are. Um, you, you can see there's sort of vistas. So I kept seeing things. I kept, you know, I kept saying, look, look at this. So look, look, at, look, look. It's as if I didn't live there before. <laughs> <laughs> And so, being at home, being in that place, which is also part of the Lenape Trail. I mean, it was, it was, it, it was, it was, it, it really inspired these things that I made. And and I will tell you, there was a moment that. I don't have enough space to paint a painting that is 25 feet long, so the driveway or driveway became my summer studio. Oh. <laughs> and so I would stretch canvases out that couldn't fit into my, my workspace and work. And I knew I had something when, because I'm not a landscape painter, I'm not. I really am not a landscape painter. The landscape painter you in can't family. Say that no, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the landscape painter in the family is Sicily, because that that's what this preoccupied her practice for over three or four decades. She's painted the landscape, but all of a sudden, I'm painting landscapes, and I remember her studios across the way. And I'm coming to the end of creating the first large landscape, uh, which I call Sleek's Garden. And she gives me a high five in the driveway. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I know that I nailed it. <laughs> I mean, it was such a beautiful poem. She gives it just spontaneously. She's coming towards me, and I'm finishing up this long thing. And, and I, I have to tell you, it was labor intensive. There's, there's sweat coming out from me and falling on the canvas. Of course, it took two days to recover from me. <laughs> so, 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 Roger, before I yeah, say any more, um, uh, did I answer your question? You <laughs> did answer my question. I'm so. And some, which, which is great because that's why we're here. Yes. Um, you, you mentioned a couple of things that stand out for me in that answer. One was your collaboration with Sicily. Right. Very few artists have, are married. Well, there are artists married to artists. There are artists who have very different practices. Right. And you and Sicily, up till now, I felt had very unique practices. I associated. Most of your body of work was abstraction. Yeah. Um, I associated Sicily's work with with landscape, with color, with with collage. Um, how did how did your being together for these two years 
really inform this, this work that we're seeing here. You know, some people have um, painting assistants, studio assistants. How did your collaboration work? Well, I, this, this collaboration was something that was, I think we should think of it as, as a kind of a one-off. We don't necessarily see ourselves collaborating as, as artists on an ongoing basis. I mean, we've done things before, but nothing as coherent as, you know, um, I think this was particularly fulfilling and both emotionally, and I think it was particularly fulfilling creatively because we didn't tell, we didn't tell, we, what, what we did is we created some parameters. Sicily, we, we said we're gonna work on paper this size, we're going to, and, and we're going to, you know, you go off and do whatever you're going to do. And I went off and did what I was going to do. We, there was no plan to make landscapes. I just made landscapes. And nobody told me to do that. And in fact, since we had finished a couple of landscapes prior to the project becoming a collaborative one, our collaboration, and so it just kind of organically developed. I mean, we didn't make any plans, oh, could we could do some more of this or anything like that. This just happened. And maybe the catalyst for it was just being offered two shows, two solo shows. And, and we, decided, we decided it was maybe there was an economy somehow in doing, you know, a joint show. And, but being at home um, at first was challenging. Let me tell you, to be, to be you know, um, uh, it's one thing when you away for, for eight hours, <laughs> and it's something else when you're in, you're in the same space with your partner twenty four seven. <laughs> so we had to, we had to, we had to, we, we had to be. That's where created really had to be created, uh, and you know because it, it's funny how you, how you. My, my, um, we have a we have a, a, a rule about studio space, and your studio space is your sanctuary. You kind of you don't I don't go into her studio space unless I'm invited, and I do not comment on anything unless I'm asked. <laughs> <laughs> These are wrong rules. You pass through, you see something. Well, nobody asked you anything, so. And um, and so this is this is this is a kind of a understanding. Um, I had a teacher, Rudolf Barnick, who was my mentor at Pratt. Um, Rudolf painted some dark things. He was Ukrainian, not Ukrainian. He was uh, Lithuanian. And um, Rudolf and May Stevens, who was also a teacher of mine at Pratt. And they uh, they lived in Seoul, and they had studios. They had lofts. His loft was on top. His loft, her loft was on the bottom. And they had rules similar to ours. You don't you don't come into you know. She was a feminist. You know you don't. You're my husband, but I'm an artist, and you don't come into my studio unless you're invited. You know you have to knock on the door. You're invited, and if I'm too busy, I'm working, you may not get in. So anyway, so, so we've got a, a, a sort of similar arrangement. But I started to tell you that for a reason. I'm trying to remember what my reason was. Well, we talked about collaboration. Oh, the collaboration, yeah. So, so, the collab so, so it got, we had to set up certain kinds of systems and procedures and protocols. But I think we've pretty much survived. Um, and out of it, this, we've, we've, we've developed um, a really, I think, strong bond in terms of, of uh, partners and as artists. I mean, I, I don't think I could have done this body of work unless I had the support of somebody who understood what it is I was doing and why it was so important. But that's always been there, anyway. I mean, I think, you know, so... Yeah. So, <laughs> so, 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 
this was this was good for this was good for our relationship. It was good for my my. Uh, I mean, one of the things that I had was a, a, a uninterrupted studio time that I hadn't experienced. I, had, I didn't have for a long time. When was the last time you had that kind of time? Uh, um, oh dear. <laughs> Um, that long. That long? Yeah. No, no, no. You know, I, Cicely used to call me a binge artist because what would happen is that when I got a block of time, I would sort of cloister myself and work like a madman. And then I would go back to, you know, running a nonprofit, which is, in which I did most of my working life. Which, yeah. But also expressing New York. You're always putting fires out. I mean, mm -hmm. things are going in and out of balance. And so, if you, if I've, I've been in a situation where you start a painting and then when you get back, you're trying to figure out where exactly did, where did exactly did I stop? What was I thinking when I started making, when I was making, you know, painting this passage? And, and you know, it, it, it's just, it's just a, it's just, look, I had fun making this work. It was not uh, a cakewalk, but it, but I felt passionately about this, 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 this material and this, this subject matter. And, and um, um, this is block of time was very, very, using it this way was very fulfilling. Yeah, I, I've been to your home, and I was there when one of your massive pieces was posted on your garage, yeah. and it was almost it was overwhelming because again I know you as a as an artist of social issues, of uh, issues around ideas, conceptual work, and here I am I'm immersed in this incredible uh, environment which is the the first ridge that in West Orange we live. And then you're recording it, and I'm saying, how is how is he doing this? Where is this coming from? So it it, it, it was a very um, exciting time to, to witness. I, I I've seen your exhibitions in other places. I was even in Cuba with you when you were you had your work there at the um, the at the gallery. The excuse me, the um, museum, the in, National Museum, National Museum in Havana. Yeah. So this was otherworldly. And I think as we sit here, and as you and I are sitting here, we're sort of immersed in this world yeah. that you've been living in for many years, but never recorded. Yeah, well, you know, um, I, I was a bit uneasy about this work, of course. I was a bit uncomfortable. Carl Hazelwood, my co-founder of Aljara, said that um, um, the reason I was, I, the reason I was, uh, uneasy with this work is because I exposed myself. I, was, I exposed my vulnerability. And, you know, I was trained as a representational artist and um, I spent a lot of my uh, uh, I spent a lot of my time after being trained as a representational artist rejecting it or trying to reject it. Um, um, and it's, the training is really a training about seeing, how to see, how to look at things. Um, and so, um, I, I always felt, I mean, the work, it's interesting, if you compare this work with the work, with the show that I did at the Pharaoh, not very long ago. It, there's no congruence between that and this. And the, so... The men's show? The misogyny, the, the misogyny show. The oh, mis yes, yes. The misogyny paper show. Right, right. And what Carl said, his insight was really good. He says, yeah, that's all supported with ideas and theory and stuff like that. You're painting from your gut. And you just like, it's like you just exposed yourself and you were feeling vulnerable. And that, and, and that, and that, that rang true to me that, that I, I, 
Why would I want to be in landscape? This is, this is like soft porn or something. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want to do the hard stuff. Undo, you know, I want. But, but I also sort of reconcile this by saying, you know, that, you know, my life is, is I also experience the beauty around me. I mean, it's so, so, it's almost as if I was suppressing, suppressing this. And, and, and this, and, and sometimes this work felt, there's a phrase that Cicely uses that, that I, I, I co opt, I, you know, I cop that phrase for myself. Um, the work drops out of you, it drops out of you. It, 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 it's in, in the sense that you, you're painting, but there, when you're, when you kind of like, you're, you're in that place, it's, it's painting itself. No? Yeah. 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 You're, it's painful itself. I mean, I've heard writers say that too. You know, that you're, you're kind of, when you, when you're in the groove, when you're in that place, it's, it's almost as if it's, it's writing itself. The book, the page, the essay. Yeah. So, so some of that, yeah. It, there's also, there's also an experience of coming down too, like from that, that place. I mean, I, I really felt quite tired after making that body of work. It's, it's almost like the, the, the you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. The, you know, we talked about, or you shared with us, how this pandemic, how COVID uh, had this impact on this body of work. It allowed you the time to create it. Yeah. Um, has there been any other series or body of work that you've created that was informed by a world event. Well, the show, the, the look, the the, the the politics of misogyny. I mean, which is something that my, I, you know, I became uh, my, my there was a kind of a heightened awareness of this of of, of misogyny in the culture. Uh, when the previous guy was in the house. Uh, it, 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 so if you could explain to the audience the, the misogyny series, what was the genesis of that? Because we're talking, we're familiar, but... Well, that, that's a... That's a, a we, we, put, we purchased the house next door to function as a studio rather than having, sharing a, a floor in a factory building. You know, as artists, you want to think about ways you can uh, sustain yourself. And so, what we discovered on the floorboards is somebody had spent maybe decades doing these uh, drawings on turn of the century magazines, in which which were pretty much um, misogynist and altering them in such a way. I mean, it's a huge commitment and a huge body of work, which I was told I should put to the curb, and I kept it. <laughs> I didn't know what I would do with it, but I kept it. Because I thought there was something curious about this the creator, the invisible artist. And, and it, it, it did lead me um, to, after 10 years of keeping this material, boxes and boxes of material, to an understanding that this was, misogyny was not just the hatred of women by individual men, that it was systemic, that it was something that was ingrained in the culture, that it was something that had to do with a particular scene through, a particular scene women through a particular lens. And that was also a kind of awakening for me, um, because I, I, as I read more and more about the, uh, I looked at the literature, you know, I, um, and I'm not a scholar, scholar but I, it was, it was, uh, it was very, it was very, for me, it, it sort of raised my consciousness about that. And so, 
that that body of work was a response to that. It was a response to, and, and I became much more aware. Of, you know, I I can't separate. I can't as a man. I can't separate myself from from it. I mean, I'm, I'm you know all men are privileged in a certain way. So um, so yeah. So it was it was, it was a kind of a, a, an examination. You know, uh, an educating uh, educating myself in that. I mean, it, it, it's not over. It's, it's I've got a large body of work which deals with it, but but it's you know it's something that got trumped. Oh no, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> something that got trumped by these these beautiful things because I just needed during COVID. I I just felt that I needed so, something beautiful. I just needed to. To, 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 to shift my attention to something that was, you know, not dark. I mean, it, look, the COVID thing was one thing, but, you know, having somebody who's telling you that you should drink, what, what, what was it? Something? Is oh. just Bleach. Bleach. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was a, it was a very, uh, uh, it was a very surreal time. Yeah. Uh, so anyway. So, so that body of work is more social political. It was about race. It was about politics. It was about privilege. It was about the the, um, the, the in, look. You had forty women accusing the president of the United States of of some form of sexual harassment or abuse. You had you had America's favorite father, Bill Cosby, getting exposed. For drugging women, I mean stuff like that. How do you wrap your head around this stuff? And then you know, then COVID, and then they're out of things too. You know, the closing of expressing. I mean, it was a lot. And so uh, this work, yeah, the genesis of both bodies of work come out of major things that are happening within the environment or within the culture. So they do inform. The work. the work never occurs in the vacuum. Yeah. The the uh, the Napi Trail, the land of the Lenny Lenape people. Yeah. Um, it's this is a historic landscape. Yeah. It's so charged. Yeah. With so many historical elements. Over the period of time of creating this series, did you? Was there any energy coming to you from this? All the time. You walk. He walked to the South Mountain. He walked to the, um, the reservation, Eagle Rock Reservation. He walked there at least three to four times a week. It's about an hour's walk back to and fro to, a, to the reservation and back to the house. It's about an hour's walk. It's exercise. And there is, a, you know, there are trails there. And there's a fantastic panoramic, panoramic view of the city uh, skyline of New York. Uh, there's also a pretty, a pretty good restaurant. I don't know if it's, I haven't gone back since they said it's COVID, but it's a little bit shishi. It was a whole, you know, it's one of those restaurants, uh, Highland Pavilion, where you could sit in the window and see the view right across to New York, this New York skyline from, I don't know, from where, from. Well, it's about 12 miles west. Right. 12 miles east to New York. Right. From the first ridge. So, sometimes we walk through the woods, and sometimes we just follow the, you know, walk along the path that runs parallel to the Rock Avenue. But it's, yeah, I mean, it's, I'm always seeing and experiencing this environment. So, and I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of the history of, of the trail, and by the way, the trail that is, ex I was told that the trail that exists right now is not the real trail. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I'm also mindful of people, first people, being removed of, 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 of you know, the land, the clearing of people off the land. So, so, so those ideas are also operating in my head. And I refer to them in the titles of the painting, Deliberately, because I want to recognize and honor the Monarch people. Yeah. And, and, and 
you know, we've heard and been told that everything's deliverable. And even in the beauty of these pieces, the creation, you know, you've just shared with us, again, this idea that nothing is sort of separated. <coughs> Yeah. No, I think things are connected. Yeah. I mean, in, 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 sometimes not in very overt ways, but they are connected. Yeah. Thank you. Um, many have remarked about the extraordinary technical ability pairing in these incredible paintings. As an academically trained artist, known for powerful and deftly realized abstract compositions, in all media, are you surprised by their the exclamations you're getting from the musical analysis. This is an interesting thing because my friend here, Dr. Hawkins, talks about <laughs> the ease with which I move from representation to abstraction. It's a kind of a, it's a kind of a, um, and maybe at some point she talked about that. But the point is, is that I. This may not be completely true, but I I think style is like handwriting, or it's it, you don't have to. I'm an abstract artist. This is my style. You don't have to be that deliberate about it, because I think sometimes I have an idea and then I decide how I'm going to express it, and and that that is because I have a certain facility. And I, you know, and that's because, and I'm not quite comfortable with the word academic. Um, uh, yeah. So, you know, there's a kind of unease that I have with, you know, academia. And, I, and, and, and Fran, I love you. So, <laughs> um, but, 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 but there's a sort of tension. Um, but, but um, yeah, people have remarked, yeah, because this is not something that, what, one of the things I think about um, being skillful and being talented uh, um, is that sometimes there's a comparison that, that, that is made between Vincent van Gogh and um, the Academy. You know, I mean, he doesn't conform to um, a lot of the rules, but the work always is always powerful. It's like the I compare sometimes, and I know comparisons are odious. I hear that all the time. But I compare sometimes, if you know Emma Amos's work, Emma Amos was a was a child prodigy. She's she's got fantastic skills as a drafts person. You see her draw the figure. And Fit Ringle. Fit Ringle, you know, was criticized, not to say by who, but, but she couldn't draw. But her work carried packed a punch. There was something that was visceral, that was powerful, that is powerful. And anybody who doesn't believe that, you need to go see the show now at the new museum. Finally, Faith is getting her flowers. Yeah. It, it, it's, and we be honored Faith twice in the jar. But there's something that is so powerful with the work that it doesn't have to, um, it doesn't have to, I mean, the, the more I live with that work, the more I feel this is brilliant stuff. She brings into this space of fine art, craft work. She turns, there's a, there's a body of work that she did call the French collection, which Cicely illustrated the first catalog uh, for that um, before, before uh, years ago. Um, and she turns this, she turns 